Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast season two. In this episode, we'll discuss the important issue of the hand swabs taken from Sheila Caffell. The evidence presented to the jury was that scientists who handled the bullets and loaded the magazine had far higher lead levels than those present on the hand swabs of Sheila Caffell. Therefore, they argued that this proved Sheila did not fire the rifle and so couldn't have been the perpetrator. Essex police were responsible for deciding which tests should be carried out and if they already knew that Sheila was responsible for the shootings, then gunshot residue tests, also known as GSR testing, would prove this. Could this be why the hand swabs from Sheila were never tested for GSR? A recent reanalysis of the evidence contained in the thousands of case documents disclosed in 2011 was conducted in the latter part of 2021. From this, previously unknown evidence has become apparent, which we reveal in this episode. But first, we begin by setting out the Crown's case at trial. The jury heard that only a single set of hand swabs were obtained and these were taken from Sheila during the post-mortem examination carried out by pathologist Dr Peter Venesis on the 7th of August 1985. These hand swabs were initially rejected by Huntingdon Laboratory when they were first submitted on the 9th of August. This rejection was owing to concerns of the scientific staff regarding possible cross-contamination from other firearms-related items. When DSI Ainsley took over the investigation on the 7th of September, he insisted that the hand swabs should be tested and they were resubmitted to the laboratory on the 13th of September, where they were then accepted. When these swabs were tested for the presence of lead, they showed only low levels were present. Comparison tests were conducted and two lab assistants were used in order to do this. Each of them handled 18 bullets, then their hands were swabbed and tested for the presence of lead. These results, according to forensic scientist Brian Elliott, produced much greater levels of the presence of lead than had been found on Sheila's swabs. Therefore, the Crown asserted, this proved Sheila could not have loaded the magazine or used the rifle and therefore she was not the perpetrator. However, no consideration was given to the fact that Sheila's swabs were taken hours after she'd handled the weapon, the bullets and the magazine, but those of the scientists were tested immediately after handling. Nowadays, powder residue that is deposited on the hands when someone fires a gun is prevented from rubbing off when the body is moved by covering the hands with a paper bag. But Sheila's hands were placed inside plastic bags, which potentially could have rubbed off this residue. An examination of the summing up of the case, as delivered to the jury by the trial judge, now shows that he misdirected them in two separate areas where he summarised the hand swab evidence presented at the trial. Firstly, he stated, You will recall that so far as the traces of lead found on her hands, Mr Haywood, the forensic scientist, said that there was no more than could have been obtained from the atmosphere, no more, in other words, than you or I could have on our hands at this very moment. But it was Huntingdon Laboratory chemist Brian Elliott and not Huntingdon biologist John Haywood who had produced written evidence and testified about hand swab results at the trial. It is possible that the judge was simply confused. However, as the blood evidence of John Haywood was relied upon substantially in the judge's summing up, and was reiterated following a jury request to recap the blood evidence, the act of combining blood and hand swab evidence and crediting it all to Haywood could have impacted on the jury and their reliance on this evidence, as it would seem more reliable coming from the same scientist. 
A second misdirection contained in the judge's comments was when he stated, Her hands were put in contact with the gun if the defendant committed the murders when he set up the appearance of suicide. This was wholly misleading and speculative. There was no evidence of this and was simply the Crown's case. The judge did not offer any alternatives for the jury to consider and he didn't raise the possibility that Sheila's hand was on the rifle as a result of her taking her own life. Nor did he suggest that her hand was put into the photographed position by the police when they removed the rifle from her body on several now provable occasions. Neither did the judge suggest that Sheila's hand was moved by D.I. Cook for the purpose of photographing the blood on Sheila's nightdress. For Justice Drake to supply only the singular, unproven and speculative prosecution argument for the jury to consider was leading them and goes against the role a judge should play in any trial. At the 2002 appeal, the defence raised issues regarding the hand swaps. These concerns consisted of two primary issues addressed by the court as separate matters. These were that information was withheld from the defence about the examination of the hand swabs and that it was not merely the result of error. It was contended that the evidence demonstrates impropriety by the police in deliberately concealing the true picture. The further suggestion was made that the police may not have submitted the genuine swabs but rather obtained similar swabs from some other source and substituted them for the swabs taken from Sheila Caffell in order to produce a result favourable to the prosecution. Whilst these issues were rejected in 2002, we now have further evidence which supports the defence arguments put forward at the appeal as well as fresh, previously unknown evidence which clarifies that Sheila did handle the bullets and fire the rifle. There's a sequence of events which demonstrates how vital evidence which implicates Sheila as a perpetrator was hidden from the trial. This is in direct relation to the collection, examination and manipulation of the hand swabs. Regarding the recovery of the hand swabs, there were two police officers who were responsible for seizing exhibits who were present at the post-mortem examinations of Sheila and Neville on the 7th of August. These officers were DC David Hammersley and DS Neil Davidson. The same officers also attended the post-mortem examinations of June Bamba, Nicholas Caffell and Daniel Caffell on the 8th of August. Davidson failed to make any record of hand swaps in his notes, but Hammersley gave evidence in a statement dated the 22nd of October that during post-mortem examinations, he seized the bags which covered the deceased's heads and bodies and said, I also took the following swabs from Sheila Caffell, DRH slash 33, swabs, left and right hands, head. However, Hammersley failed to mention in any evidence he has ever provided, including in 1991 and 2002, that he also took hand swabs from Neville Bamba. But we know by studying the disclosed material that hand swabs were taken from Neville because the pathologist, Dr. Vinicius, told the post trial Dickinson inquiry in 1986. The standard examinations were conducted on Mr. Bamba and Sheila Caffell, including hand swaps for firearms. Davidson provided an account of what happened in the mortuary to the Metropolitan Police in 2002 during their collation of evidence for the appeal and stated that he realised early from the general discussion that the hand swaps would be of vital importance. This is because it could confirm or disprove that Sheila had shot the family. Davidson also confirmed in this same statement that Hammersley was responsible for taking the swabs and that he wrote up the documents. Importantly, Davidson also stated that only one set of hand swabs was ever taken to his knowledge. So why would Davidson lie about this? 
And why would Hammersley fail to mention hand swabs were taken from both Sheila and Neville? The pathologist was clear that swabs were taken from both, so what happened to Neville's swabs and why was their existence hidden? The hand swabs supposedly from Sheila were submitted to the lab on two occasions. The first time they were rejected owing to possible contamination. Now on to the rejection of the hand swabs and the reason for the initial rejection of them at the lab. Oddly, this was set out on four different versions of the laboratory submission form, dated the 9th of August. Each version contains a written reason the hand swabs were rejected and each have significant noticeable differences in the signatures. Are we to believe that Davidson changed his signature on four different occasions? A message form, also dated the 9th of August 1985, timed at 3.15pm from DS Lovell to DS Wright, states, advised that item 17 not accepted at lab due to contamination risks as it came into the laboratory with firearms not connected with this case. DCI Wright not pleased with circumstances of rejection. So what of the exhibit reference numbers? Once Ainsley took over the investigation, and with his insistence that the swabs should be tested, things began to change, with the swabs now having not one but two forensic exhibit reference numbers. On the lab submission documents dated the 9th of August, the hand swabs are referenced as item 17 with the forensic identity of DRH 33. The lab submissions documents dated the 13th of September are referenced as item 75 with the forensic reference identity of DRH33 and DRH44. Was this, therefore, two sets of swabs, Neville's and Sheila's? Essex Police have stated that the above evidence does not signify that there were two sets of hand swabs taken that were then submitted to the laboratory on two separate occasions under two different lab numbers with two different forensic identity numbers. Essex police argue that this evidence relates to only one set of hand swabs with understandable mistakes being made to referencing and documenting the paperwork. And yet how can this be the case when scores of documents reference the hand swabs as both DRH33 and DRH44? And this is why the chain of evidence is so important in this case. In his witness statement dated the 22nd of October 1985, Hammersley, to whom the DRH reference identity applies, stated that on the 7th of August 1985 he obtained DRH 33 swabs, left hand and right hand's head. On the 8th of August he sees DRH 34, the top pillow and pillowcase from the right hand side of the bed in the main bedroom. And on the 9th of August, he sees DRH 44, a paperback Bible, on the bedroom floor to the left-hand side of the bedroom, next to Sheila Caffell's body. So this issue raises a number of questions. Did Hammersley deliberately attempt to deceive Huntingdon Forensic Science Laboratory by resubmitting the hand swabs with the identity of DRH 44, which he had supposedly allocated to a Bible? Were new falsified lab forms created to mislead the jury? In addition, it is well documented that the Bible recovered from next to Sheila was referenced as DRH 44. Therefore, what happened to cause the reference number to be reapplied to hand swabs? Could this have been to purposely muddle the evidence and create a false forensic case? Fresh evidence has been discovered in relation to the resubmission of the hand swabs to the laboratory on the 13th of September at the request of Ainsley. Evidence now appears to show that two separate sets of hand swabs were received at the laboratory on the 13th of September. The lab documents relating to that date make reference to item 75 and have both forensic references DRH 33 and DRH 44. It has also now been discovered that the hand swabs were not admitted through the main booking area at Huntingdon Lab but were taken through a different door 
and were personally received and accepted by forensic scientist Anthony Rogers. Mr Rogers only makes a single witness statement dated the 4th of September 2002 and was not requested to give evidence at trial regarding accepting the hand swabs at the lab on the 13th of September. In his statement of 2002, Rogers described the procedure he followed and set out a complete description of how these swabs with the reference of DRH33 had been packaged. He stated, From uh, records available to me, I can state that on the 13th of September 1985, I personally received a firearms swabbing kit item DRH33 from Essex Police. As is normal practice, the kit was received at the laboratory via an entrance separate from the normal entrance used for the submission of exhibits in order to avoid any possible contamination of firearms related material. Item DRH33 consisted of a standard firearms discharge swabbing kit in a cardboard box which was sealed with adhesive tape and two signed labels. This box was contained within a sealed plastic bag which was also sealed with adhesive tape and a signed label. Upon arrival at the laboratory, the item was placed inside another plastic bag which was then sealed before being accepted to the laboratory. This whole package was then stored in an area of the laboratory away from any possible source of contamination from firearms related material prior to examination. This statement raised a number of interesting factors. Rogers explains in detail the packaging when the swabs were received by him at the lab. The box was sealed and therefore it raises the question of what if anything was different with the packaging. When DRH33 was submitted the second time in September than when it was submitted before in August when the swabs were rejected for possible contamination reasons. What was different now that made them forensically safe? With the swab sealed as described, how can there have been any concerns on the 9th of August 1985? On the initial submission regarding contamination, if they had been packaged this way in August? Why were there three exhibit labels attached to a supposed single exhibit, two on the box and a third attached by tape to the exterior plastic bag? Why have these exhibit labels never been disclosed? Why does Roger's name not appear on any of the disclosed lab documents dated the 13th of September? In addition, the set of hand swaps labelled as DRH44 cannot have gone through the back door and to Rogers. Therefore, how were these accepted into the lab? Examination of the lab record shows that those swaps were accepted by DS Lovell, the exhibits officer who manned the front desk at the laboratory. So this raises the question of why the results from one set of swaps has been and still remains hidden from the defence you may wish to draw your own conclusion about that. In addition, no documentation has been disclosed to indicate if swabs were also taken from the hands of June Bamba or the reason why swabs only appear to have been taken from Sheila and Neville. Were Neville's hand swabs swapped with Sheila's? So what about hand swab tests that were conducted on the two scientists for comparison? In this statement dated the 12th of November 1985, chemist Brian Elliott stated, Tests have been conducted in the laboratory on two right-handed members of staff who had no prior contact with firearms or lead metal. The two people, one male and one female, were asked to load a total of 18 cartridges into the magazine from the self-loading rifle. This required two separate loadings of the magazine by each person. Following this, the hands of each person were separately swabbed using swabbing kits of the same type as the kit 75. These swabs were then tested for the presence of lead in the same way as the swabs from the kit 75. Significantly higher levels of lead have been detected on the hand swabs from the two laboratory staff than were found on the hand swabs from the kit 75. 
In each case, the level of lead on the right hand being higher than that of the left hand. From the tests conducted in the laboratory, I would expect the hands of a person loading cartridges into the rifle, 18, to bear appreciable deposits of lead. No such deposits have been found on the hand swabs from Sheila Caffell. At trial, Elliot admitted that he had not conducted these tests himself, but had been told about them. He did not name the person responsible for conducting the tests. Mr Rogers failed to give any evidence regarding his examination of the hand swabs in this, his only witness statement, which seems odd. However, it's known that he examined the swabs as Brian Elliott named Rogers for the first time in a witness statement dated the 4th of September 2002. In his statement, Elliott said, The firearm swabbing kit, the hand swabs, exhibit DRH33, were, according to the laboratory notes for the exhibit, received directly by Mr A. Rogers of the laboratory on the 13th of September 1985. Mr Rogers examined the kit making the notes on the 24th and 29th of October 1985. By the time I examined the kit on the 29th or 30th of October 1985, the analysis had been completed. I made some comments on the two pages of notes before initialing each page. My comment on the second page was NB photo 63 in album shows right hand of S. Caffell in contact with magazine part of rifle. So this again raises a number of important questions. Why did Elliot never mention the hand swabs being accepted at the lab by Rogers on the 13th of September in any of his previous statements? Why did Elliot never mention the examination of the hand swabs by Rogers on the 13th of September? Why did Elliot then re-examine the swabs over a month later? Why did Elliot sign the general examination record dated the 13th of September if he didn't examine the hand swabs that day? Did Elliot and Rogers sign all three exhibit labels? Could a further undisclosed examination of the hand swabs have been conducted on the 2nd of October 1985 at 2.55pm a message was sent from Malcolm Fletcher from Huntingdon Laboratory to DCI Wright of Essex Police and this message stated He asked, are the hand swabs of Escafel being looked at for lead? Re, lead areas on hands from loading mag would do tests to see if visible lead on hands is possible. If so, then consider looking at swabs. It is possible that the examination of the hand swabs conducted by Elliot at the end of October may have happened as a result of this communication between Fletcher and Wright. However, as the swabs had already been tested, what reason could there have been for this additional examination to be conducted? A couple of months ago, a document was discovered in the case material titled Swap Testing and revealed the fact that Sheila had both lead and copper results recorded and states Sheila Caffell shows a very small increase in lead but nevertheless present and an increase in copper cartridge case and her copper peak on the left hand is at least as high as those of the others at test. Whilst both Lead and copper are very common elements to be found in a household environment. The copper is also a component of the cases and features in all graphs. Sheila Caffell's iron peaks are as great as any accounted for by handling the barrel. This evidence is key as it sets out unarguably that the results were wholly consistent with Sheila having handled the bullets and the rifle. Nothing was said at the trial or in any of the witness statements of Elliot about the copper and iron levels of Sheila's hand swabs matching the levels present on the samples taken from the scientists who loaded and fired the rifle for comparisons to be made. And yet here is the proof that they did. We now have additional forensic evidence that Sheila fired the rifle. This is included in a recently commissioned forensic report which is currently under review by the CCRC. We will disclose this additional evidence in the very near future. The evidence set out in this episode has revealed an explanation for the different reference numbers of the hand swabs, and it's now apparent that two sets of swabs 
were taken, one from Neville and a second from Sheila. Only the lead evidence was put forward at trial, the jury being told they were low levels, meaning she could not and did not load and fire the rifle. If we were to accept the Crown's argument regarding the lead levels being lower than those of the scientists, one way that now can be undermined is that a clear handprint in blood consistent with having come from Sheila's right hand can be seen on her nightdress and on the crime scene photographs. Therefore, it is not unreasonable to state that she would have wiped her blood-stained hand on the nightdress. This handprint is referred to by the pathologist in his notes initially, and yet by the time of the trial, pathologist Dr. Venesis changed his evidence, now saying that the handprint was not a handprint at all, but was smears of blood from Sheila's wrist. Forensic examination of Sheila's nightdress has been denied to the defence as it was illegally destroyed by police in 1996 against court orders. If we were to believe the Crown and the level of lead they stated at trial was present, as well as the clear handprint on her nightdress, it is also a possibility that Sheila washed her hands at some stage. In fact, at trial, ritualistic washing was a feature of the defence argument to explain the lack of blood on Sheila's hands. We know that her nightdress was covered in blood. The photos clearly show this, which would suggest her hands would have been too. Washing and wiping her hands may therefore have reduced the lead levels, yet despite that, her copper levels were still as high as the test samples. The evidence had revealed that two sets of hand swabs were taken, one set from Neville and one set from Sheila, and yet why have Essex Police not admitted this, or provided all of the results? Why did the second set of swabs have the forensic identity which had already been allocated to the Bible? Why were one set of swabs submitted via the back door and one via the front desk? What are Essex police trying to hide? What is clear is that what has been disclosed to the defence pre-trial regarding the results of the hand swabs was incomplete as was the misleading and false information that the jury heard about the low levels of lead on the swabs of Sheila. The defence and the jury were also entitled to know the contents of the document referenced as swab testing, which we'll just remind you stated. Sheila Cathal shows a very small increase in lead, but nevertheless present, and an increase in copper, cartridge case, and her copper peak on the left hand is at least as high as those of the others at test. Whilst both lead and copper are very common elements to be found in a household environment, the copper is also a component of the cases and features in all graphs. Sheila Cavall's iron peaks are as great as any, accounted for by handling the barrel. Why did the jury or the defence have no knowledge of the copper levels which matched those of the scientists who conducted experiments handling the rifle and loading the magazine. It's possible that Essex police, as they did with a number of issues, such as the moderators, conflated two separate sets of forensic results regarding the hand swabs and only chose to present at trial the elements that fitted the prosecution case. Did the low levels presented to the jury actually come from Neville's hand swabs? Forensic exhibits that we know were taken but have since mysteriously vanished. Why were the defence and jury lied to about the copper and iron levels which we can now show were actually as great as those of the scientists who were tested? It can only have been an intentional act to mislead the jury to only discuss lead levels on the hand swabs. In addition, what was the reason that no GSR tests were conducted? Or were they actually conducted and the results hidden? Essex police would need to be accountable for the deception and omissions set out in this episode. They should explain why such key evidence regarding the test results achieved from the swabs, which showed that Sheila had loaded and fired the rifle, was never disclosed to the jury. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to do something to help Jeremy Bamber, 
then sign our online petition to the Home Secretary for the disclosure of case documents still withheld by Essex Police. Visit www.change.org and search for Jeremy Bamber. And don't forget to share the link with your friends and family. Thank you.